Jeff Gauthier, uh, founder and CEO of Startup Genome, and we're here to talk about the amazing, emerging, and really also powerful clusters, startup clusters in Denmark. So I'm going to ask each participant to introduce themselves, but really to introduce your startup clusters. What are the key technologies that you're working on, the key verticals? But also I'd love to, you to give us one or maybe even two ideas, two examples, practical examples of what are the the solutions, the products and services that your companies are developing, your startups are developing. Yeah, cool. So I'm uh, Mikkel Christoffersen, I'm a cluster director for Odense Robotics, uh, which is a robot cluster. And the robot cluster got a very fine introduction from the minister in one of the last sessions. Um, so, <clears throat> but what the companies and the startups we're working with are actually trying to do is, um, if you talk about production or agile manufacturing, they're trying to take away the jobs which is dull or dangerous or dirty in production and replacing those jobs with robotics. Um, so that's really a mature market for, for startups and for robot companies. And it's a market which is growing all over the world right now. The other half, more or less, of the startups, they are working in the new application areas. It could be in uh, construction, it could be in farming, uh, in the food tech area. Uh, a very good example of that is actually a startup we are working with, which is called FarmDroid. So FarmDroid is uh, developing a small solar-driven robot, which can uh, seed and weed farms in, uh, in organic farming, where you cannot use pesticides. And instead of uh, weeding uh, as a manual process, we have this small robot which can go around really slow, but uh, tending up to 20 acres uh, for a farmer. So that's a very good example of uh, how you can use robots for, for new applications. So the cluster has been growing for more than 30 years, uh, and it's a very good example of how can uh, municipalities, uh, public authorities, how can uh, RTOs like Danish Technological Institute, uh, University of Southern Denmark, and of course all the companies work together to uh, create an ecosystem. So it's a very interesting place to be. So the ecosystem has formed some very big successes uh, during the last years <clears throat> and two major exits. Um, and one of the well-known companies, of course, is Mobile Industrial Robots. We're doing, of course, robots who can... It's a collapse robot, but it's also a mobile robot. Um, and they uh, have a tremendous big of growth and fast time to market. Uh, and they got acquired in, in 18 by Teradyne in the US uh, for 1.7 billion Danish kroners, uh, which is sort of equivalent to 34 times uh, last year's turnover. Can you, can you give us an idea of what is their most popular <coughs> robot? What does it do? So the most well-known area uh, of robotics that the companies are working on is of collaborative robots. It's a product category which is invented in Odense. It's uh, invented by the people behind the founders of uh, Universal Robots. It's a product category which is really good for agile manufacturing in small and medium-sized companies. It's uh, fairly cheap to buy, it's uh, safe for humans to work together with, and it's very easy to give it new tasks, which is needed in agile production. <clears throat> so what, did it, what did it do? Just describe me one robot, what, did, what would it so do? So, typical application of collaborative robots is handling of objects. So picking up an object in a pallet, uh, placing it in a CNC machine, waiting 20 seconds, taking it out and placing it in another pallet, which is a job a lot of people actually do. Uh, and 99% of all production companies uh, in the world are small and medium-sized companies producing for order. And in these kind of situations, sort of traditional robotics is not really well suited because it's made for automotive sector or for really big volume production. So, um, but the smaller order producing companies have a much more flex, a much more um, need for, for agile manufacturing. Thank you. Well, that reminds me of my student jobs. That was, uh, really gives me memories of what I used to do for, for, for making some money during the summer months. <laughs> what about you? Yeah, student job or? <laughs> 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 no, I'm, um, 
Yeah, I'm Thomas, and I'm a CEO of Copenhagen FinTech, uh, which is a cluster organization or an innovation organization that works within FinTech, of course. But FinTech is like broadly defined because that's also moving into many you know, other different uh, industries. Um, we, uh, we were established three years ago uh, by the Bankers Association, the Financial Services Union, um, which I think is, is um, quite extraordinary on, on kind of a global scale that the union actually goes in and, and takes responsibility for some of, uh, some of the innovation going on in the industry also. And then um, Municipality of Copenhagen and, and recently joined also by the Confederation of Danish Industry, so we also have a close relationship with the more traditional um, industries also. So, pretty exciting stuff. We do everything from incubation to acceleration and everything in between. We have 50 companies sitting with us, and, and during the past three years, we've had around 100 companies going through us. So, we, we see a lot of different startup ideas and a lot of different companies and founders. Can yeah. you give me two examples? Of like yeah, yeah. Good solutions. So one of the very early companies that was uh, actually one of the first residents in the lab was uh, Chainalysis. I don't know how many of you know uh, know them, but uh, they're working with uh, within crypto. Uh, so they're working with uh, with the blockchain uh, technology, and they are, um, so to speak, the uh, the investigators in in crypto and are helping actually law enforcement and uh, intelligence agencies with doing investigation within uh, the crypto space. So when someone hacks your computer and demands some ransom for, uh, for unlocking it, you know, these are the guys that can, can look at it. Uh, if there's terrorist financing or whatever, you have governments uh, calling these guys and then help them uh, investigate. Um, okay. So they're creating transparency in, into, uh, into the, in the crypto world. So that could be one company. And then uh, recently we had uh, Lunaway, which is a Nordic uh, neobank. Uh, so they got they got funding, but they also got their first uh, the first banking license in many years given in Denmark. So now it's it's, it's a full fully fledged bank uh, and creating another banking experience and a t very targeted a, a very um, a special segment, the millennial segment, right? So so that's another example of that. Thank you, Kian. Can you tell me what yeah. what you're well, working on? Uh, <coughs> my name is Kian Hein, and I'm the Managing Director of uh, Public Denmark, and we are into GovTech, uh, the uh, sector that uh, the panel before the break spoke about. Uh, so we're, we're really into technologies that help uh, the government uh, performing better than, uh, than us. Um, and it could be, in fact, all kinds of verticals. It could be robotics, uh, handling uh, case management better. It could be fintech, uh, helping the tax uh, system. It could be uh, green tech, health tech, uh, better care of the elderly. In fact, all the, the sectors and all the tasks that the, the public sector deliver to the, to the citizens. Uh, um, we don't have a, a, a physical space uh, as of yet, but we would like the, to, to, uh, to be one. Um, for examples of who it could, it could be, it could be uh, we, came, we had a, a company who were measuring uh, the water uh, pollution in water pipes, and they had developed a small device that it could uh, put into the water system and that uh, uh, monitored whether the water was uh, polluted or not and whether the, the system was uh, wasting water. Uh, and the new thing about this one was that it could transmit uh, data from the water pipes and also it could uh, re-energize itself by the, the current in the water. So that is quite a new technology, making it easier for, for government to measure uh, what is the condition of the water system. Amazing. And what, what are the assets, what are the advantages of you know, Denmark for GovTech? Why GovTech? Why GovTech? Uh, because the public sector of Denmark is very digital. Uh, the UN uh, said that we, or says that we are number one in the world in, in that space. And that means that as a 
political system we are used to digital uh, digital services uh, and there is also an expect expectation uh, from uh, citizens and uh, companies alike that the service that they get from uh, from government is uh, quite uh, digital and is uh, quite uh, effective the other thing is that we look into some very heavy burdens on the public se sector in the in the future uh, uh, more elderly people to be taken care of uh, and, and the like. So we need to look to technologies to help lifting that, uh, those, uh, those problems. So you're really building on the strength, on the local strength? Yes, we are, yeah. Robotic is also a strength. Can you tell us like, what's the performance really? And give us a good image of you know, what are you creating? How big is it? How, how, much, how many scale-ups? How big are they? So <coughs> the the overall figures for the cluster is that there are 130 companies working within robotics and automation. And they're all placed in or around the city of Odense on the island of Fyn in Denmark. So it's been growing um, uh, rapidly uh, since 2010. Uh, we've seen uh, more than 80 startups uh, coming into this ecosystem. Or let me put the other way around. More than 80 of the companies we have in the ecosystem today are founded after 2010, so there has been much more startups, but some of them are not here yet, so or still. So um, it's a highly global cluster. So more than 65% of the turnover in the companies are coming from export. And um, if we're talking about the companies doing not solutions, but products, it's actually more than 75% of the turnover, which is global. So the startups are actually oriented towards a global market uh, from day one. And, and they know they have to build a final niche where they can uh, generate a turnover in companies um, and then take this out to, uh, to a global audience uh, very fast. So it's, um, the export has been uh, going up more than 50% in two years. So it's, uh, it's picking up. Wow. What are the size of the two largest companies? Uh, the two largest companies uh, today is the one is Universal Robots, which is uh, today 700 people. And the second largest company is one of our food automation integrators, uh, which will be around 400 people now. Sizable, great. What about FinTech? What are your success stories? What's the performance of the, of the cluster? So I think, we, um, I think actually the, the cluster and the performance builds on some of the great success stories of like the Saxo Bank, and which is actually maybe even one of the first uh, fintech companies in Denmark um, back in the early 90s, right? So, um, so that's definitely one success story that, that pretty much every one of us know, and, and like Simcorp and uh, also Nets, and, and many of the, of the bigger banks also have a, like a huge um, investment into IT. And out of that, you, you can say, comes Copenhagen FinTech, uh, or the FinTech uh, with the startups. And, and right now we see the scene, we have around 250 companies working within that, what we define as FinTech. And that grew from three years back from around 70, what we counted. Um, I think what we see now is, and they just, they are headquartered out of, uh, of Silicon Valley, but um, TradeShift just became a, a unicorn last year when they got a, a huge investment from uh, Goldman Sachs. But we also have like Chainalysis that I just mentioned now, they started in the lab three years ago and, and um, I think they're approaching a couple of hundred people now uh, to, you know, within the blockchain crypto space. Um, <clears throat> um, and then, then we have a, you know, tons of other uh, upcoming, we have Plio that just raised one of the biggest rounds, B rounds in, uh, in the Nordics. Um, so, so there's a lot of stuff happening. It's, it's clear that when you grow so fast from 70 to 250, a lot of it is still early stage. So they're still looking for a product market fit in, in, in the Nordics, Denmark and in the Nordics. So I think some of the focus also going forward will also be to kind of, of uh, uh, take it through the funnel and, and, uh, and uh, globalize it um, and make it uh, scale. Thank you. So, Kian, these, these two clusters are really you know, several years ahead of you, but I yeah. imagine you have big objectives as well and yeah. an action plan in front of you. Tell us more about that. Yeah. Uh, we believe that the, the global market for GovTech is, is about uh, $400 billion. So, it's, it's, it's quite large because uh, obviously uh, the government is a big spender of, uh, of IT. And 
our focus is on startups and on new technologies and what they can bring to, to government, uh, both at the, the state level and at the local level. But um, uh, in fact, we see it very much as a bigger ecosystem. So it's not only about uh, startups, it's not only about the, the small SMVs, it's also about the, the larger companies. So you could you could argue that also a company like Net Company, uh, which is a huge uh, IT provider for, for the government, is a, uh, is a GovTech uh, company. So for some uh, jobs, it will be right to apply smaller companies and uh, new technologies, <coughs> and for other jobs, it will be more right to apply larger systems and to have a, a larger uh, vendor. But what we do see is that there, there is a need to, to, to shift the culture, both among startups to, to, to see an interest in doing business with the government, and also from the government side uh, to do business with startups and to, to reach out for them. So that is really the, the area that we look into. Uh, and how do you plan to change that culture? How are you trying to affect it? We are, currently we are, we are running the GovTech program for the Danish uh, government and, and of course we would like that to see uh, growing also to more ministries and also to the municipality uh, level. And we would also like to see uh, exp experiments or new models to come for the, for the interplay or for the cooperation between uh, the public and, and the, the private sector. Uh, and to see a new scene growing out, out of, of uh, that. So that is really what we are pursuing. And likewise, uh, we would like there to be a physical place for GovTech uh, in, uh, in Co Copenhagen, like the, the place that uh, Thomas has and the, the place that, that you have, uh, where uh, civil servants, uh, university uh, people, uh, investors, startups, uh, more mature companies can come and inspire each other. Uh, so that is a part of our, our plan uh, as well. And finally, there is, uh, of course, uh, the funding issue. And if you talk GovTech, many uh, uh, traditional venture capitalist uh, com companies, they, they, will not, uh, they will not go with that because they, they would like to, to see a, a possible ice hockey stick or a, a, a more fast traction. And that's not the way that it normally is in GovTech. Uh, so we need some money that is still uh, risk willing but that that uh, can uh, can uh, do with a longer run and how are uh, procurement laws changing to to help you and in, in this building this cluster do you see do you need some changes in, in regulations for the cities to be able to purchase from yes. small companies with no capital or or is already there what is the no. situation you no, know, it is. Uh, I mean, there is a strict regulation of the, on the procurement of uh, of the government, uh, and it's EU uh, regulated. But still, it's uh, it's our experience that it might be stricter enforced in in Denmark than uh, than in other places, and uh, and at least there is some models that uh, that could be uh, put in place. Um, and also, the, so that means that there is a, a cultural uh, element uh, into this that you could uh, go down uh, alleys that's not been uh, uh, tried before. Okay, thank you. So I want to talk about like the goals, maybe make big statements about where you're going, where's your cluster, how is it going to look in three years and five years? Right? What are what are your your big stretch goals. Maybe you can tell us what's exciting for you. How, where do you want to be? Where do you bring? What do you want to be? Where do you, where do you want to bring Denmark in robotics and in three to five years? So I'm st still sit I'm sitting here trying to getting used to being the most mature cluster in the, uh, in the company. <laughs> so uh, I'm always used to being uh, the, the youngest cluster when we talk about <laughs> the ecosystems. So, but in this company, uh, we uh, we've suddenly become the most mature company. Yeah. I think they are Old and wise. Yeah, So that's a uh, totally new experience for me. So, but we have so many objections that we're working on uh, together with the companies and together with the authorities uh, helping us. So uh, one of the ambition is to, to keep uh, attracting the best startups uh, from all over Europe to expand the position that we have uh, today as being the best place to develop your robot startup in Europe. Um, we're also looking into how can we actually bring some of this out to startups in, from other places in Denmark. So we think it's really 
uh, stupid in, from a society's perspective. If, if you have a startup in Copenhagen or, or in other parts of uh, Jotland, that you don't have the same acceleration as uh, the startups with the geography in Odense. So that's something we're looking into. Uh, we're also working on, uh, and I think that's key to, to keep keeping a right balance in this ecosystem, is we're working on can we attract more funding for, uh, for research? Can we um, help get more PhDs at universities? Because we can see that the most interesting startups we're working on are based on knowledge coming out of PhD studies uh, or made from people who have uh, done PhDs at university level. So we definitely need to sort of increase research in order to keep balancing this ecosystem in the growth uh, as we're looking into now. And then we're looking into also how can we do, how can we expand being global? So we have companies who are very good at exporting and who are born globals, uh, but we're also looking into how can we set up a more a stronger infrastructure to support the smaller companies to do this as easy as possible and as fast as possible. Okay, and how, how, how many startups do you think are going to be in three to five years? Are you ready to make some forecasts and give us big numbers? Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's a tricky question. <laughs> so I, I think that we'll... I hope we can maybe double the number of startups that we're working on right now in the future. But you, f you feel like you're already number one in Europe in robotics, right? So it's, it's already I think there's a lot of impressive. places in Europe where you can actually develop an, uh, an idea for a robot uh, coming out of research or other development work, but it's, it has become really difficult to actually commercialize that knowledge and that idea. Yeah. So if, you, if uh, there's a good mix in the ecosystem of people who are actually doing new knowledge, uh, but also with people who are, have uh, the business smarts, uh, smart money, uh, and know how to actually commercialize this. And I think that's what's needed. It's both, both is needed. So that's your key challenges is talent and sound like, and also well, if, if we're talking about key challenges, market globally. Uh, if we're talking about key challenges, we have to talk about the recruitment. So the companies are desperate for recruiting talented people, and they're desperately needing uh, people all the time to continue the growth. So some of the big companies in the cluster are onboarding 150 people a year. Uh, and they need, uh, also the smaller companies need uh, that kind of uh, talent to keep growing. And actually and these, these are technical people, engineers and... No, it's technical people, it's uh, engineers, it's software people. It's uh, people who have been working in sales and marketing, maybe working globally before. Uh, but it's also actually STEM educated people. Uh, so 42% of the people working in the cluster are actually electricians or blacksmiths uh, with uh, further training who are actually doing the implementations uh, around the world. So it's many kind of talent. Uh, but it's, uh, when we ask the companies about the challenges, 78% of them are talking about recruitment as number one. So wow. that's key challenge. Yeah. Thomas. Yeah. What are your big objectives? I know oh. you, you have big ambitions for we the, have a lot the cluster. <laughs> Conquer the world, take over, uh, world domination. Um, no, it's Viking style. Yeah, yeah, Viking <laughs> style. <without> the, yeah. <laughs> um, so I, I think it, there, oh, there's a lot of things, but um, I, I think we would, we would like to work even more, and we already do that with some of the, the bigger global financial institutions and also the, the, the Nordic ones, but you know, work with them and their capabilities to actually do the partnerships. Because that's one thing we see, that we, we can be kind of the uh, facilitator and the intermediary in that, in that kind of game and, and be the translator between, you know, something that is very agile and constantly changing and, and then the other thing that's been used to really the opposite of that for a long time, right? So, the, so working, working, you know, between those two, like the incumbent players and, and the startups. So that's one thing we want to develop. I think you already mentioned the talent side. That's of course something we see. So, so a, a huge, um, a huge part of our bullet on our agenda is, is attracting foreign startups. So, even outside of Europe, to actually say, you have, guys, if you want to scale into Europe, if you want to be a global scar uh, startup, and you want to scale into Europe, do it, do it uh, with, this, with Denmark as a starting point. Then. We're in, uh, not the biggest, not the biggest market, but that makes us a, t a, you know, a really good test bed and test market. Uh, and then from there on, you can basically scale to the rest of Europe. And we begin to see some traction in that. We we have a Nordic fast track program where we get foreign startups in and we help them connect with the necessary partners in the Nordics. And then from there on to Europe. Um, Going back to goals yeah. a bit. Like so I know you have one unicorn now, so are you going to go yeah, for three yeah, yeah, unicorns within the next three years? Yeah. What is, a, yeah, I think what is your vision? 
yeah, we still want to work on, on the number side, but I think it's less important going forward. So, so this from now on, it, it, it's going to be like working with, with the ecosystem and maturing and bringing more competences and preparing them for that hopefully scaling journey and, and globalization, right? So it's, it's about bringing in competences from the outside because I think, frankly, that's, that's what Denmark also needs. Um, a lot more people that's actually been doing that journey before and, and can sit down and, and help some of these founders um, with their scaling strategy. And, um, and then on the funding side, because that's very closely connected to, to scaling, of course. Um, and, um, and we are building our network in that and, and uh, even also considering, you know, what, what kind of, can we play a more active role in, in that that we do now? Um, so, uh, so we have a lot of uh, a lot of ambition, and of course, we want to see we want to see more unicorns. And I see uh, like the Chainalysis or the Nordic API gateways or some of these ga these guys, the the Luna ways. That I think they're on a very good um, uh, traction, and 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 some of these will, will definitely be unicorns within the next I don't know two or three years. And uh, what's the situation here in terms of you know, having a sandbox where the where the, the startups can, can work and, and not be subject to the same laws as the big financial institutions. So, uh, you know, we work in, in different places. In Kazakhstan, they give, they give themselves a, you know, financial sandbox for, for fintech startups. Sure. In Abu Dhabi and Sydney. Sure. So what, what is the situation here? Did you get that, that kind of help from the yeah. regulator? So, first thing, I think, uh, because there was a lot of talk at some point, you know, about sandbox and, yeah. Financial service is not the only place that you know these sandboxes exist, and, and it's a great way of, of of testing your solution and ideas, and and maybe at some point also get some regulatory relief. But I think one the first step is to actually understand what is a, sa a sandbox, or just like what do we mean by that? And I think in in Denmark, we took a very um, proactive approach. So the um, the regulatory authorities here, we we're very happy with the collaboration with them, and and they actually. Uh, did what they called the um, the fintech lab, uh, or the fintech uh, yeah um, lab, where they they kind of work with both um, a sandbox where they where you can apply and you get accepted, and and they work with them very closely, uh, but also just the the way we interact with the uh, with the regulatory authorities, it's 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 really good. So I think that's definitely one of the strong points coming from outside of Denmark, and especially also when looking at the other Nordic countries, I think where we. What we see in, in both Norway, Sweden, and, and also partly Finland, we have pretty progressive regulators, and that is also looking. They will be in Singapore uh, later this year together with us, with a big delegation of, of uh, both incumbent players and startups, uh, um, and um, and looking towards learning from the UK because you know, obviously UK is is also in front here. Yeah. So so what I'm hearing is the government's very proactive, and that's probably very. why. Uh, the World Bank or World Economic Forums was ranking you number one in, in government, right? Yeah. I also, uh, one of the key enablers we see is really having local corporations, and so here, you know, financial institutions, but also insurance companies working with startups. Yeah. And I heard you earlier before saying that was, that was an issue, that was difficult to activate the local large financial institutions to work yeah, with startups I think here. How is it going? What are the challenges? And <coughs> I think if you look at the different, um, you know, within the f uh, areas of fintech, you know, you can take, I think banks just, um, they, they felt the heat for a longer time. So, so they're starting to come around and, and now it's more, it's not so much about, you know, do we believe that we have to partner up or collaborate? It's not so much about that. It's more about how do we actually make it work? It's not because we don't want to, but it's more like we need to practice, you know, we, it, it doesn't come naturally to us. Um, so, so that's one thing. I think, um, I think when it comes to uh, to the insurance, I, there's a lot you know, on a global scale, especially also in, in Europe and in Germany, where I know you've just been there, uh, happening in the insure tech space. I think if you look at our ecosystem and you look at, and we have this pie, right? So that's insure tech is definitely the smallest, uh, and they're having a hard time because there's not that much interaction. So that's one thing we would like to accelerate and. And try to facilitate some more uh, some more discussions, but but also to to be honest, like expose it to uh, to the insurance companies outside of Denmark, uh, because they're very eager to play. Yeah, thank you. And Kian, when you know, we talk about activating the local customers for you, it's governments, right? Yeah. 
And yes. we talked a little bit about procurement laws that where you need help in, in changing some of that. But also what we find helps a lot is when you have great examples of success. Yeah. Yeah. And that helps you attract more startups to say, okay, I'm going to go uh, and, and target government as customers, cities and national governments, regions. Yeah. Uh, what are your key, the key success you can point to of startups in the last few years here that have, have been able to create a big business with governments? I mean, I don't think there is that many smaller companies as of yet that have, have gotten that, but there are, of course, bigger companies and, and who, who've got a lot of business with, uh, with government. Uh, but there's not a traction, a great traction as, as of yet of, of uh, GovTech uh, companies or startups uh, doing that. Um, but part of our ambition is though to, to put Denmark on the world map as the GovTech uh, hub. Uh, and meaning that we would like to attract uh, talent and to uh, uh, attract uh, capital uh, going to, uh, to uh, Copenhagen. And also seeing that there are great opportunities here to work uh, closely with uh, government at, at all levels and to, to uh, make test bets. Uh, it could even uh, be a collaboration across the, the Nordic uh, country, uh, countries uh, about this because we, uh, in many respects, when we look at the political system, we, uh, we are a like, and I think also the, the expectations of the of the citizens are like that we are welfare systems, uh, so we provide a lot of uh, of services for the for the citizens. Uh, so that would be be our ambition for the, for going forwards. One exciting project I've heard, you know, I think since a couple of years ago, is this data open data project, right? We do government. Yeah. I think that's that's very exciting. T tell us more about that. What does that mean for for the startups, for the opportunities? It's. Uh, I mean, it, it it means that especially on on the on the health sector that we are trying to to. Uh, 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 have data being open to everybody to to work with, but it's it's and there's been done a, a great work uh, at various players in this field, even to to uh, make it uh, visible where are the data and who can access it and 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 who can hang, who can do the, what with it, and the government is is trying uh, to uh, to make this uh, happen and. Um, not only with health data, but data uh, across every sector where it's possible, so so it can can be uh, provided to everybody to to use. Um, and this is also a project that is uh, running at a at a Nordic uh, level, uh, where the viewpoints are the same. That we would like to put the data out for everybody to uh, to grow their business or to to do other do other things. So that can really be a competitive advantage for for Denmark. Huh? Yes, it sure could. Sure, yeah, that means like AI startups, analytics startups, big data startups can really come in and really create new, new, new value using that data and then export it right? because they've developed a model and they can apply it elsewhere. I guess. Yes, yes, they could. And and what is also strong, and we also heard today here, is that the, the, the data ethics side is very strong in in Denmark and in in the Nordics. So that so it's 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 data that is. I mean, the the regulation around the data is is what you would like to see. So we're talking about challenges, and one of them is, of course, to you know export and really be born global. And you were talking about that already about like how a lot of your companies are born global but then still there's there's the challenge of really creating global growth right sales marketing really experienced talent that has done it before uh, so what are your plans to really uh, improve this right, and change the mindset and you know develop those skills so i don't think actually we have to work on changing the mindset i think i think the right mindset is really there already and very driven by some of the very strong role models we have had in the ecosystem who have created really big successes and shown how to do this. And actually, I've in my career previously, before I've worked in robotics, I've worked in the software industry and other industries. And what I've learned there is always that every customer say, OK, we're completely different from the other customers, uh, which are even, they're never. Uh, all, all Danish municipalities are more or less alike, even though they say we, uh, we're very different from the other ones. Um, but it's not like that in robotics, uh, so it's a totally new experience for me. So when the role models have done something which actually works, then the other companies say, okay, let's do the same thing. 
So uh, I don't think we'll have to really work on changing the mindset. Uh, but we'll have to work on setting up infrastructures which can support the growth of these companies, uh, also internationally. Uh, a very good example is that we actually, together with the municipality of Odense, uh, has a yearly investor summit. Uh, and this year, uh, I think there was 170 investors and more than 30 startups pitching there. And the investors were global, uh, coming from all over the world. And the startups were actually also coming to Odense to seek funding for developing the startup. Uh, and also, also a lot of uh, local startups there. So that's one of the things we'll have to keep increasing, saying, OK, can we also attract more capital from our side, uh, from the companies? Then we also have to look into how can a group of smaller companies of SMEs work together to solve problems for very big companies uh, who have automation issues or automation challenges. So uh, we have to look into can we sort of support uh, consortiums of small companies working together to address really big customers out there. So that will be some of the things we'll have to look into. Okay, so, so when you talk about infrastructure for going global, give me a, maybe a little bit more about what does that mean? What, what does that mean, infrastructure for going global so and if, helping them? Actually, there's, there's different phases in a startup or robot startup. Uh, the first critical phase is getting a minimal viable product you can actually sell to customers fast. Uh, and I think uh, we have sort of developed a very good system for supporting that. Uh, the next phase is actually... Can how, how do you support that? And we, uh, together with a lot of partners in the ecosystem, we are running this uh, incubator uh, where we are supporting a number of Rodox startups. Uh, but the ecosystem is also supporting startups which is not in our incubator. Uh, so there's a willingness to support startups and to work together with startups. Uh, That's in a, local, in a phase. local multinationals working on with the, with no, the it's more or less uh, partners from the ecosystem, other robot companies, uh, university level, uh, RTO organizations, okay. uh, but also the pilot customers who are willing to sort of work with new companies. So I think we have a very good infrastructure for this phase, for the minimal viable product phase. The next phase, which is critical for these startups, is actually to build a global sales channel uh, fast and to bring in the right people who have done this before and uh, who can do this very fast. That's very difficult. It is difficult and it's always uh, time to market which is important in robotics. So we have seen very big companies forming who have had a good of runway, of a long runway to build this uh, global presence. But for the companies we see today, they need much to do it much faster in order to compete with the global competition. And I think in this phase, uh, we'll have to look into how can we support the companies more. Yeah, and, uh, and uh, working, developing Salesforce in other countries and continents. Bringing in the right people and then Challenge. setting up the right partnerships and the, the right sales channels. Having VP sales that have done it before in the US exactly. and Asia. Yeah. yeah. That's really, that's probably hard to find right now in this stage, right, of the ecosystem. Yeah, it's fairly hard, but it also manages uh, succeeds for a lot of the companies. So. Yeah. What about FinTech? What is the, the challenge there? It's like. So I think it's a little bit different because uh, Without me being an expert in robots, I would say, you know, if a robot works in, in Germany at a car factory, it probably also works at a car factory. And so there's like the regulation and the financial services and the products and the kind of the systems in the different parts of the world are maybe a little bit more different. And the problems worth solving in the Nordics is very different from the problems you have in the Philippines, for instance. You know, if just for as an example, you have like 75 or 70 or 75 percent of, of the population in the Philippines is not banked. So if you, you know, you don't have that problem in Denmark or in, even in the Nordics, you know, people are banked. You know, who doesn't have a bank account? So I think it's, it's, it's a little bit of our understanding also. So, so how does, you know, the problem I'm solving here, how can that actually help solving problems other places uh, around the world? So the uh, first problem is kind of problem market fit, right? Like yeah, yeah, and, and and understand the context that that you know, uh, you know, because it they, it can definitely help solving those problems, but but maybe just in a in a in a bit not another way. But also understanding the, what the world offers on scale, that you know, if you solve some of these very fundamental problems that that fintech is set out to do, whether it's financial inclusion. Um, transparency, decent, decentralization, or what it is, you know, there's huge opportunities, not only within finance, but in, in many other sectors. And, and I think when it comes to, for instance, the, the sustainable agenda and the SDGs, um, it's a well-known fact that, that, uh, that FinTech, in, channel, in, in helping channelizing the, the investments and um, it, into some of these, uh, in some of these projects, there's a huge potential there. 
And, and we can see now, I just read here before I came here, that, that one of our companies is now doing a project in, uh, in Germany where you pay with your crypto every time you're, uh, you fuel your, your, your car. Yeah. And, um, and if you drive, uh, you know, uh, don't speed or avoid potholes, you earn crypto and blah, blah, blah. So there's a lot of different industries where there's a lot of opportunities here. Well, thank you so much. We always say in uh, you know, Startup Genome that it's, the first step is to build a broad foundation for the ecosystem and increase startup quality in general and give them all kind of general programs. But the next step is really to focus on your strengths and develop specialized clusters. And that's what you guys are building. So I congratulate you and I wish you good luck Thanks. for the future. But it's going well. Thank you. Thank, thank you so you. much. Thank you.